Raconteurs and Spoken Realms present short stories by H. G. Wells, Volume 1. There was once a little man whose mother made him a beautiful suit of clothes. It was green and gold and woven so that I cannot describe how delicate and fine it was. And there was a tie of orange fluffiness that tied up under his chin. And the buttons, in their newness, shone like stars. He was proud and pleased by his suit beyond measure, and stood before the long looking-glass when first he put it on, so astonished and delighted with it that he could hardly turn himself away. That was the beginning. For three weeks this strange affection of Davidson's eyes continued unabated. It was far worse than being blind. He was absolutely helpless, and had to be fed like a newly hatched bird, and led about and undressed. You come, he said, up to the moment. I had forgotten the number of your house. How do you do, Mr. Eden? I was a little astonished at his familiar address, for I had never set eyes on the man before. I was a little annoyed, too, at his catching me with my boots under my arm. He noticed my lack of cordiality. Wonder who the deuce I am, eh? A friend, let me assure you. I've seen you before, though you haven't seen me. Is there anywhere where I can talk to you? The war correspondent was one of those inconsistent people who always want the beaten side to win. When he saw all these burly, sun-tanned horsemen, disarmed and dismounted and lined up, he forgot altogether that he had called these men cunning louts and wished them beaten not four and twenty hours ago. Manhood versus machinery occurred to him as a suitable headline. Journalism curdles all one's mind to phrases. Miss Winchelsea was going to Rome. The matter had filled her mind for a month or more, and had overflowed so abundantly into her conversation that quite a number of people who were not going to Rome, and who were not likely to go to Rome, had made it a personal grievance against her. Some, indeed, had attempted, quite unavailingly, to convince her that Rome was not nearly such a desirable place as it was reported to be, and others had gone so far as to suggest behind her back that she was dreadfully stuck up about that Rome of hers and the way in which Miss Winchelsea put herself upon terms of personal tenderness with Horace and Benvenuto Cellini and Raphael and Shelley and Keats. If she'd been Shelley's widow, she could not have professed a keener interest in his grave. A warm night, said a voice at my side. I turned my head and saw the profile of a man who was leaning over the parapet beside me. It was a refined face, not unhandsome, though pinched and pale enough, and the coat collar turned up and pinned round the throat marked his status in life as sharply as a uniform. I felt I was committed to the price of a bed and breakfast if I answered him. I looked at him curiously. Would he have anything to tell me worth the money, or was he the common incapable, incapable even of telling his own story? There was a quality of intelligence in his forehead and eyes, and a certain tremulousness in his nether lip that decided me. Very warm, said I, but not too warm for us here. No, he said, still looking across the water. It is pleasant enough here, just now. It was very difficult for Wallace to give me his full sense of that garden into which he came. There was something in the very air of it that exhilarated, that gave one a sense of lightness and good happening and well-being, there was something in the sight of it that made all its colour clean and perfect and subtly luminous. In the instant of coming into it one was exquisitely glad, as only in rare moments and when one is young and joyful one can be glad in this world. And everything was beautiful there. Wallace mused before he went on, telling me. You see, he said, with the doubtful inflection of a man who pauses at incredible things. There were two great panthers there. Yes, spotted panthers. 